Providence is written all over your life as a believer. The problem is, most of the time, we're so tied up with the here and now that we miss it. We miss what God's actually doing. Can I remind you, God knows all things. God decrees all things. God works all things. And God sustains all things. Jonah is one of those hard books to find in the Bible. So you're allowed to look in the index if you're struggling. Don't be proud. Every so often I get a blank on Jonah. I'm like, anybody else? Whenever you, like Jonah comes up like, where is that in the Bible? Like, oh, no, hey, Aaron hey, Brown's not. He's, he knows everything. Page 732. Yeah, you beat me to it. <laughs> so yeah, it's one of the minor, he's one of the prophets. In fact, go, go to the end of the Old Testament and just keep going left. If you start hitting Naaman or Micah, you know you're getting close. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish and he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Verse 12. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know, I know, that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah chapter 2 verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and I heardest my voice. I've called this message this morning. There is only one way you can look when you're on your back. Does that make sense? There is only one way you can look when you're on your back. You know, there's times in our Christian walk that we blame the devil on every dark experience that we go through. The devil gets a lot of blame for a lot of stuff. Would you agree? Yeah. Huh? If we're not careful, he can get, be a convenient diversion or scapegoat from the reality of what we're actually going through. What I'm saying is sometimes we go through hellish experiences because of our own foolishness and because of our own rebellion. Amen? This story is proof of that. The story of Jonah starts off with God giving him orders and an assignment. And we find that in verse 2. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. It might be difficult for you and me living in our day to really grasp why Jonah struggled with this. Um, you know, we've had 2,000 years of evangelism where the gospel has reached out to the Gentiles. The gospel has uh, reached the, the uttermost part of the earth in regard to the Great Commission. Um, so for us, it's normal. Evangelism is normal. But Jonah lived in a day where evangelism was unheard of. Um, Jonah was called here to undertake a huge task for the Lord, one that had never been done before in the Old Testament. He's commissioned as a Hebrew to bring this life-changing good news to a heathen city called Nineveh. How did it go down with Jonah? 
This great man of God. In Jonah's thinking, Israel was God's chosen people. Yay! We are the people. We have the truth. We're blessed of God. These dirty, vile, stinking, wicked Gentiles, what do they deserve? Hell. They don't deserve to experience the grace of God. Why would you want to waste your time on them? You know, I, honestly, sometimes we read this stuff as if you know, we're kind of somehow different. We're better than that. A lot of times we don't want to share the truth with people that aren't like us. Would you agree? There's people out there that we just don't like because of what they believe and how they act and whatever. And we don't want to go to them with the, the beautiful news that Jesus has given us. In verse 3, it tells us, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, this is one of the dumbest things a human being can ever do. Run from the presence of God. Would you agree? But there's twice there that it tells us that he run from the presence of God. I mean, how can anyone think, especially a believer, how can they think that they can run from his presence? But the story of man from the beginning, right from the Garden of Eden is, is man running from God. And man trying to hide from God. By the way, can I remind you, Adam and Eve were in a perfect relationship with God. Okay, so let's just, you know, let's go back to the start. Maybe you're in this service this morning and you're running from God. Maybe you're trying to hide from God. Well, that is the height of insanity. By the way, he knows everything about you. He knows what you're thinking right now. He knows what you're feeling right now. He knows what you're going to say before you even say it. He knows what you're going to do before you even do it. That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 139, 7, Where shall I go from thy spirit? Or where shall I free from, flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, Behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall <coughs> uphold me. Brother, sister, we can't flee from his presence. In fact, one of the greatest revelations you can get is that God knows it all, he sees it all, and he's in control of it all. Did you hear me? God knows it all, God sees it all, and he's in control of it all. Do you believe that? Yeah. You know, we say, oh, we believe in the sovereignty of God. And then we act completely different to that as if God's not sovereign. So true. On a Friday night, he's looking over your computer and he knows exactly what website you're on. He knows whether you're on a righteous website or whether you're looking at perversion. Amen? Brother, sister, you need to be real before God because he knows it all, he sees it all, and he's in control of it all. Christians might not see or know everything you're doing. Your spouse might not see or know everything you're doing. This pastor might not see or know everything you're doing. But the one that really matters does. Hello? Would you agree? Yes. You know, we think, oh, we're getting away with this. And all the time, God's just come on like, like, who do they think I am? They think suddenly, I, like, I, 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 I suddenly have, like, I'm sleeping. The Bible says God doesn't slumber or sleep. By the way, we're under 24 hour surveillance. So, if there's anything that can sober us up more, is that. Like, we have, uh, we have security cameras in our house, okay? We put them on when we need to put them on. Um, but, we don't always have them on. But, the one thing is, he's always observing me. 
he's always observing you. And he's always observing the wicked. Do you ever see this? Well, I do that to look sometimes. I'm like, <laughs> he does the same back. <laughs> he does the same back to me. <laughs> well, he's always looking after us. We're not always looking at him. Amen? So let's be honest at the start of this message. We can't hide from him. We can't get away from his presence. Like the old timers used to say, you can run, but you can't hide. Huh? Now, before you're too hard on Jonah, okay? Before you write him off, how many times have we acted like Jonah? God has spoken to us. God has said, I want you to go that way. And what do we do? We went that way. Amen? You know, I feel like, I feel sorry sometimes for Jonah. And I feel sorry for Peter. Because preachers beat them up so hard that as if they're up here and there and Jonah and Peter's down here. Let me tell you, there's a bit of Jonah in all of us. And there's a bit of Peter in all of us. So please do not underestimate what we're looking at in this story this morning. Joseph or Jonah is so stubborn that he refuses to repent and turn back. In fact, he would literally rather drown than go to heathen Nineveh and share the gospel with these ignorant people. Is that terrible? He would rather drown. There was no repentance on that boat, by the way. Hello? And he tells him to throw him overboard. So he would rather drown than actually say, God, forgive me. This is such blatant defiance of the instruction of God. But in verse 4, it says, The Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken. This tells me that God sends all this to waken us up, <coughs> to correct us, and to re redirect us to face the right direction. The lesson here is the age-old lesson of history. It is smart to listen to God, and it's foolish to ignore or rebel against His instruction. You know, God has ways of turning us around. Don't think that you're the master of your own destiny. <coughs> That's foolishness. He is the master of the waves. He knows when to send a storm into your life. And he knows why he sent the storm into your life. Amen? Amen? Most of you know what happened next. The boat to Tarshish wasn't as pleasant as it first appeared. It may have felt, oh, this looks really appealing to my flesh. By the way, our ways, it always ends up wrong. Yeah. If you're governed by your own desires, wants, opinions, it's a disaster. The easy way is not always the most comfortable way. What seems appealing to your flesh can easily be made very uncomfortable by an all-known, all-powerful, and omnipresent God. Why is that? Because His plan for your life is that you would fulfill His blueprint. He will bring you to a real low, if need be, to get your attention. I know we go through a lot of stuff and we're like, why Lord? Why God? You know, this was no chance storm that Jonah got caught up in. Would you agree? Would you agree this just wasn't a happen chance? This was happening because of Jonah's disobedience. Now think about this. Think about the enormity of this. The weather submits to God in order for him to get the attention of one of his disobedient servants. A whole storm that affected many people happened because he was interested in this one child of God. 
William Law, Christian writer, says this, He who complains of the weather complains of the God who ordained the weather. Huh? Oh, it's a terrible day today. Oh, how many times have we said things like that? Huh? Who brings the weather? Who's in charge of the weather? Are you with me this morning? That like every day is a good day, even whenever there's a pile of snow outside, Miss Rita. Every day is a good day when God's in control. Huh? And I want to say this because this is relevant. Others are blessed because of your obedience. Others are cursed because of your disobedience. Ask the guys on the boat that were with Jonah. Huh? They were going through what they were going through because of him. When you're walking in the will of God, when you're walking in the blessing of God, your family's going to be blessed. Friends around you is going to be blessed. Your neighbors are going to be blessed because you're just under the blessing of God. But when you're in rebellion, whoa, stay away from you. I hope there's not lightning about. In fact, I'm serious. There's certain people that I wouldn't want to be around when there's lightning. I'm not joking. Because I know who's in charge of that lightning. And I don't even want to be within a hound's guile of that person just in case God says enough's enough. Hello? Who's in charge of the lightning? Who's in charge of the storm? Okay, are you with me? There's certain people I just want to get, if there's a storm coming, hey, I need to run. All the best. <laughs> you're laughing at me, but you're probably the same because, huh? Just make sure you're in a house where people are right with God, okay? Um, so, verse 15. It says, They took up Jonah and they cast him forth into the sea. And do you know what happened whenever they did that? The sea ceased from raging. Imagine the effect that had on those guys in that boat. As soon as they got rid of the problem. Huh? So what I'm saying, when a storm's coming, hey, you need to go. <laughs> I don't want you in my house with the storm's coming. Just you're going to have to go. Once, once Jonah was out, it was calm. What a testimony to those guys. Like, imagine those guys going, imagine them talking like, wow, this is unbelievable. Jonah just told them the reason why this storm's happening is because of me. Then they get rid of him, total calm. They'll probably end up all believers after that. I want to say this, there's no such thing as luck here. There's no such thing as chance. There's nothing random about this story. Now, Erwin Lutzer says this. Let me encourage you to take those if-onlys and draw a circle around them, then label the circle the providence of God. The, and he goes on to say, the Christian believes that God is greater than our if-onlys. His providential hand encompasses the whole of our lives, not just the good days, but the bad days, in quotes, too. We have the word accident in our vocabulary. He does not. God doesn't have accident in his vocabulary. Would you agree? J.C. Ryle says this, Nothing, whatever, whether great or small, can happen to a believer without God's ordering and permission. There is no such thing as chance, luck, or accident in the Christian's journey through this world. All is arranged and appointed by God, and all things are working together for the believer's good. Isn't that powerful? Brother, sister, there's someone pulling the strings in the heavenlies in order to accomplish his decreed will for your life. Jonah 1.17 tells us, The Lord had prepared, the Lord had prepared, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. 
he's about to be thrown, and here's just right at the very moment, surprise, surprise, here's a big whale coming with a big mouth, just about to eat him up. Your providence is written all over this story. Providence is written all over this book. Providence is written all over your life as a believer. The problem is, most of the time, we're so tied up with the here and now that we miss it. We miss what God's actually doing. Can I remind you, God knows all things. God decrees all things. God works all things. And God sustains all things. We serve a big God. We serve a faithful God. We serve a God that's alive and active and observant today. He's not sleeping today. You might be sleeping in the service. Not all of you, but some of you. But he's not sleeping today. God appointed a storm to bring Jonah to his senses. God appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah up when he was thrown overboard. God appointed the duration of his stay in the belly of the whale in order to get Jonah to where he needed to go. God appointed the time when the wheel would spit Jonah out. It was all under control. By the way, do you think God's changed? You think God has suddenly changed from Jonah's day to our day? Sadly, it's only when you're in such a dark place that God can truly sometimes get your undivided attention. We could look at this story in one of two ways. We could ask, how would God do this to one of his beloved children? (laughs) Or, we could look at this and say, isn't it amazing how much love and how much care and how much interest God takes in his children to do such a thing like this. Amen. Hallelujah. Huh? Would you agree? Yeah. That even the animal life, the weather, he's using it all just to get the attention of one of his servants. Isn't that wild? But this whole story this morning tells me it's foolish to try and fight God. Some of you have tried that, so have I, and it hasn't ended up too good. This story tells us sometimes God's people have to go through hellish experiences in order for them to waken up and smell the coffee and also get them facing in the right direction. That's what happened with Jonah. Now, Jonah 2.2 describes his temporary abode or his temporary accommodation as the belly of hell. You know, I've heard people saying, oh, it's, it's wrong for a Christian to say they're going through hell. Or they're going through a hellish experience. That, that's belittling hell. I've, I've heard people say that. But I'm telling you what, Jonah didn't go to literal hell. But he did go through a hellish experience. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'm telling you, Christians sometimes go through hellish experiences. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen? Amen? Dark places. Lonely places. Places where it seems like you can't even hear him or see him. The belly of hell here is a very dark place in your life. It's a very lonely place. It's a very vulnerable place. It's a very fearful place. Would you agree? If you were Jonah, would you just be... Would you just be... Isn't this cool? Oh, to be in the belly of a wheel for three days. Isn't this cool? Do you think, you think that was Jonah's experience? do you think that or do you think he was fearful huh every wave do you think he was sleeping for those three nights huh this really happened but I'm telling you I know Christians that have been through hellish experiences where it's fearful it's vulnerable it's lonely and it's dark It's dark. Please be sure, no believer is comfortable in the belly of hell. 
The reason is that's not where they belong. That's not their home. They're born for heavenly bliss. They're born to be in the light, not the dark. But can I remind you, it was Jonah that took Jonah there. Just like the wicked, everybody in hell, literally this morning, is there because of themselves. Not because God is a tyrant. and God is a hateful, unjust God. People go to hell because they don't want Him. They don't want to go the right way. When we go through hellish experiences, I believe we go there because of us. I do not believe this was God's plan A for, for Jonah. Would you agree? Or, or do you think God's cool with rebellion? And he said, yeah, go ahead. That's cool, Jonah. I'm going to take you on a lovely experience here. No, Jonah took Jonah on a terrible experience. He should have been on his way to Nineveh with the word of God, with the truth of God. Like, I can't wait to share this truth. God's told me to go. It's going to be good. By the way, whenever he did go, the city repented. 120,000 people. That was a big city back in the day. That's a big city today. 120,000 of them just repented whenever he went. But he didn't want to go. So how does God typically deal with rebellion? Number one, he normally convicts you. Okay, now I'm talking about a believer here. If, if God's trying to deal with his child and they're in rebellion, first thing he starts to do is convict their heart. That what you're doing's wrong, what you're saying's wrong, you're going to have to stop that. If they persist and they refuse to t- pay attention, then God has to bring in chastisement. He has to bring in correction. I believe that's his plan B. I don't, I don't believe that. It, I don't believe he goes, whenever we rebel, I don't believe he automatically goes to chastisement. He, he, first thing, he starts to make us feel bad for our own rebellion. Then we, we palm that off. Um, I, it doesn't matter what he's telling me. I don't need to do it. I don't need to say it. So then he has to get our attention a little bit easier. Waking up. That's what he does. Chastisement is the means by which God shows us the error of our ways and the wisdom and the beauty of fulfilling his plan and purpose. You know, it would need to be a spiritually blind person that would not consider the gravity of their actions after being in a hellish place like this. Would you agree? I mean, he, if you want to get Jonah's attention, he's in the perfect place. He would need to be very hard-hearted and blind, and he wasn't. To, to be in this place and not go, I need to get myself right with God. I'll tell you the problem today is, people go through hellish experiences, and they still won't turn. They still won't change. It's like, you know what? I don't know why. Probably we're all like that. I, I'm not preaching at you this morning. I'm preaching to you because the more you kind of study stories like this, you see yourself. You see yourself in Jonah. Yeah. I don't know about you. I, I, I look at men like Jonah and I'm like, how many times have I done that? And then you blame the devil. It's, it's easy to blame the devil. Devil, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Huh? How dare you put me in this hellish belly of the whale? And the devil's just laughing. He's like, oh. And God's shaking his head going, Oh, my creatures, when will they ever learn? <laughs> if God asks you to do something, do it. If he asks asks you to change something, change it. Don't fight him. Don't be stubborn. Because if you don't, there will be consequences. Just like Mama used to say years ago, you know, there's an easy way and a hard way here. And Paul used to always choose the hard way. 
And then she used to say, this is hurting me more than it's hurting you. I'm like, yeah, right. Can I remind you, God wants the best for his children. Hello? God wants the best for his children. God always wants the best for his children. Just like you always want the best for your children. Amen? Amen? Amen. Or do you want evil for your children? Okay. Well, I'm here to tell you God always wants the best for you. So if you go, go through something like this, or you are going through something like this, you can be sure of one thing. He's doing it because he really cares. I'll tell you how much that he loves and cares for you. The Lord loves you enough to correct you if you're misbehaving. The Lord cares and loves you enough to turn you around when you're going in the wrong direction. Amen? Here's a scripture, okay, just in case you're not convinced. Job 5.17 says, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Happy is the man. Amen. Does it always feel happy? Okay. But he says, Happy is the man whom God corrected. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Isn't that lovely? Okay. So here is a perfect parent in operation. Don't miss what he's also telling us here. We should be happy when he corrects us because it shows that we're his. We're his child. When he's correcting us, he's just saying, listen, I'm doing this because I love you and I care. I really care for you. By the way, there's a lot of religious people out there that get away with all their junk. There's people that profess to be born again, that profess to be Christian, and they can do whatever they want to do, and they never seem to be corrected. What do you think that's telling you? They're not his child. And you may say, well, how did they get off with it? I hear even Christians saying that, how did they get off with it? How did they get off with it? But every time I do it, I I always get caught on. That's because you're different to them. They're not his children. You are. You, You can't get away with anything because... Amen? For those of you listening to podcast, (laughs) um, how do you describe this in podcast? (laughs) I'm watching you. Very, very familiar passage in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. says this, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, Then are ye bastards and not sons. You're fatherless. If you are not under chastisement, you're fatherless. Isn't that terrible? I'm glad that I can't get away with doing whatever I want. I'm glad. I'm glad that God corrects me and directs me when I take a wrong turn. And I thank the Lord for that. How about you? Anybody glad that you, you're, you are chastised? Amen. When you're stubborn or wayward, he takes things away from you. He brings things into your life and he corrects you and he directs you. If he wants to stop you on the wrong track, He just has to put a brick wall in front of you. I can tell you, he can really put a red light in front of you real easy. 
He can put a brick wall in front of you. You can try all you want to kick that wall down. But guess what? If he built it, you're not getting through that. And you can fight and you can throw a tantrum and you can get depressed and you can go to the doctor, go to the psychologist, whatever. That brick wall still standing there until you get it. Well, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, right. That brick wall's there because you're being rebellious. By the way, he does that to enlighten us of our ignorance. He does that to sober us up from our foolishness. And he does this to teach us the right way. I'm glad that every time I feel comfortable with where I've arrived in my Christian walk, God has a habit of bringing circumstances across my path that show me how much I fall short. Just whenever I say, I'm just glad where I've arrived in the Lord. I just I feel I've just arrived at that place where I'm good with him, I'm good with everybody else, and then boom! Suddenly a chapter opens next week and it's like, ah! It's like, what has happened? Like, can I not just go back to that chapter where it just seemed like I was on a cruise ship? And as Ron said, you end up, you're on a battleship. Just this chapter is like, there's bullets and bombs flying everywhere. It's like, no, I don't want this. Because he doesn't let us get comfortable. Do you know why? Because then pride kicks in. And we start to think that we're better than we are. And we stop depending upon him. And we stop crying help. Oh, man. By the way, if you're driven by pride... You know what he's going to do? Humble you. Never ask God to humble you. No. <laughs> I, like, if you ever notice in a prayer meeting, if somebody says, Lord, would you just humble me or humble us? You ever notice I never amen that? I'm like, Lord, I'm nothing to do with that. I know when God humbles you, I'm telling you, it's not pretty. No. no. You can pray it all you want. I... I there's a girl back in Ireland. I remember her praying it and she prayed it passionately. And I'm like, Are you sure you should be praying that? She's still being humbled. I'm serious. She's still been humbled to this day. And everything that she wanted in life, she hasn't got it. I'm like, whoa. I'm just saying, if you're full of pride, whether you pray for it or not, God will humble you because he hates pride. God he, in, in fact, he says he sees the proud afar off, but he comes close to him that is of a humble and a contrite spirit. Amen. If you're building your happiness on earthly things or earthly relationships, do you know what he'll do? He'll remove them from your life. If you're determined to do your own thing in your own way, he'll strip you of everything you have. By the way, when you give your heart to Jesus, you sign up to give him ownership of everything that happens in your life. You sign up all your rights of ownership and how things are going to work up. You go, over to you, Lord. You call the shots. It's no longer me calling the shots. It's been a long while from, you hear a lot of churches preaching that message today. We used to sing, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. I surrender all. And then he asks you to go and bring somebody to church or to witness to somebody or visit a nursing home or a hospital. And we're like, no, 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 no. The problem is we get, we, we get caught up with our own lie that we're doing okay, we're... You know, well, we're not as bad as brother this or sister that. As if that's a comparison. How about comparing yourself to the only one you're meant to compare yourself to? Yeah. Jesus Christ. How does your life compare to him? Just like a gardener tends to a garden with diligence. I'm not a great gardener. Anytime I've done it, it just seems to get overridden with weeds. But anyway, th th that diligent and professional gardener will remove all the weeds. Just like a, a refiner. 
with that silver removes the dross. Just like a potter with a clay, just molding us into who we're meant to be. That's the Lord. By the way, we're the planting of the Lord. So we can use a garden in illustration in regard to this here. When you find yourself in a whale's belly and you know why you're there, then you shouldn't need too much encouragement to get right with God. Would you agree with me? Amen. You shouldn't need a preacher to say, hey, I think, um, hello, I think it'd be a good time, Jonah, to repent. Would you agree? It would be pretty kind of, hello, like, I think I need to repent here. You should throw your hands up and just say, sorry, Lord. I've messed up. I have messed up big time. I should have went that way and I'm going this way. Now, I got this title this morning from my dad. My own dad said this. There's only one way you can look when you're on your back. I never forgot it. Would you agree in the natural that's true? Yeah. People say sometimes God puts you in your back to make you look up. That's where Jonah was. And if God has put you there, be thankful for that experience. The first step in fulfilling the will of God for Jonah's life was humility and repentance. In fact, I wrote here, by the way, the belly of hell is a place where you're forced to either give up or cry out. Help! Help, Lord! Forgive me, Lord, for my foolishness. It'd be lovely. I don't know whether in heaven someday we'll be able to look back and watch a video of this. And No, but you just wonder, will there be movies like on the new earth? Like Say, hey, Jonah's like, come on, guys. Hey, Oh, there's no, not going to be 4.30 today. It's just going to go, no, time shall be no more, okay? I get that. But, uh, hey, guys, how, how's he going to describe it? In an hour's time, there's a movie coming on. Hey, we're, the, we're going to have a look at this experience. You want to watch what it was like in the belly's wheel, or the wheel of the belly, or whatever? Huh? <laughs> the wheel of the belly. <laughs> the belly of the wheel. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> He's definitely not going to say that, okay? Because <laughs> he's going to be perfect, okay, in heaven. Just making sure you're still awake. Honestly, I think someday we may be able to just to know exactly what his prayer was. Like, I wonder what he was... Three days and three nights? What, what was going on? Or did it take him three days to get it? Like, maybe he's just like us. We don't get it right away. Like, it's like, the Lord's like, what's going on here? Like, hello? But maybe someday we'll be able to watch that movie. Better than anything Hollywood could ever produce. Or do you think it's just a, it's not a real story, it's just like a parable. Do you think it happened or it didn't happen? The, there was this skeptic, this atheist, uh, when was, was in a service one day. I think it was with Spurgeon. He says, well, you know, there's a lot of things in that book I think is just mythical. He says, especially that story about Jonah. I, I just do not believe for one moment that Jonah was swallowed by a big whale, was in there for three days and three nights. I just think that's a myth. It's a, just a parable. And I love the answer that Mr. Spurgeon gave. He says, lady... If the Bible told me that Jonah swallowed a whale, I would believe it. Because <laughs> God doesn't tell lies. Are you with me? Because everything God said is true. This is a real story about a real man. But here's the good news and we'll finish with this. Well, we'll kind of finish with this. Then... Jonah 2, verses 1 and 2. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Isn't God gracious? 
despite his stubbornness, despite his rebellion, God heard the cry of his child. And I can tell you this morning, whatever you're going through, God will hear your cry this morning. If you will simply humble yourself, take ownership for your own rebellion, say, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. He will forgive you. And do you know what happened when he did that? When he said, sorry? Jonah 2.10 says, And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Huh? Isn't God gracious? He didn't just vomit him out into the sea. He says, right, Mr. Wheel, over here, I want you right there, I want you just to vomit him out because he needs to get to Nineveh. He's somewhere important to go. <laughs> okay? But isn't God mighty? He's sovereign over the weather. He's sovereign over the animals. You know, some of you think that you're dog whisperers. You know, that your dog understands English. Huh? Hey, when God speaks to a wheel, the wheel understands God's language. When he talks to a dog or an animal, I'm serious. He can say to that donkey, talk. And that donkey can talk to a human. Isn't God a mighty God? Or do you think that's all fiction? But he actually spoke to the wheel and says, right, over there. He was in control of the weather, in control of the wheel, and most importantly, he was in control of Jonah. He got Jonah to where he wanted to get Jonah. And by the way, he'll get you to where he needs to get you, whether you come screaming or whether you come compliant. Let us pray. You know, this is a very encouraging message, but it's also a very challenging message. By the way, we're talking about a believer here. A believer going through a hellish experience. Lord, when we look at the story of Jonah, we see ourselves. Lord, we, we have been like Jonah. We have been. Maybe we've had our good intentions, but maybe we've been sincere, but we've been sincerely wrong. But Lord, what, what fills our heart with joy this morning is the fact that you would take so much care over one of your children. And Lord, that same care, that same love, that same observation that you had on Jonah, you have it on each child of God in this house. Every one of us matters to you. And Lord, you give and you take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Lord, we do fall short. We don't know. We, we just Sometimes we can't see further than the end of our nose. We think we're smart, but we're not. We think we're wise, and we're not wise. Lord, would you just, just forgive us as a congregation of any unbelief, any rebellion, any pride, anything that would cause us not to be usable for you. And Lord, there is a Nineveh around us. There's a Nineveh right on our doorstep that you've ordained that we need to reach. There's broken people, hurting people, confused people, rebellious people, blind people. And yet we drive past them and we don't have one concern for them. I pray between now and through Christmas and into the new year that we would start taking an interest in the lives of hurting, broken people, lost people. We pray your help in Jesus' name.